What's up everyone and thank you for stopping by. Today's project is the long-awaited Honda engine inspection that we took off a mower recently. Now a lot of people have been very vocal about me taking it apart so we can see just what's making all that knocking noise. Let's take a good look at it, find out what's wrong with it, and hopefully we can fix it. In this video we try and repair this engine, however it may not be the exact repair you need to make to yours. We'll explore other options later in the video. So this engine was on a mower that was given to me for free with an almost full history of poor maintenance and neglect. And once we finally got it started, it sounded like this. As you can hear, it's making quite a loud thumping noise, and that's the reason why we need to open the engine, find out what the problem is, and hopefully it won't cost a small fortune to fix. This is going to be quite an involved video, so let's not waste any more time and start taking it apart. We'll start by taking off the recoil, followed by the fuel tank, and finally the flywheel. Once the nut is off the flywheel, you simply can't remove it. The reason is the crankshaft is tapered where it's sitting, so you need to replace the nut, wedge a large screwdriver underneath it, and then use whatever tool you want to persuade it off the crankshaft. You might have to rotate the flywheel a couple of times before it pops loose. I'd resist the urge to take a big swing at it, and light to medium taps will work just fine. If you're against this method, use whatever method you want. After the flywheel is gone, we need to take off the key. This is what normally gets sheared when you hit a stump with your mower. If your engine stops after hitting a stump, you might have to replace this part. There's also some damage on the ignition coil. It looks like the flywheel has made contact with it. This isn't a good sign, and as you'll see later on, it only gets worse from here on. Now, I'm not sure how much the top of the crankshaft is supposed to move, but I have a feeling that this is just too much. It's enough movement that the flywheel has some serious scratches on it from the coil. Now, I know the flywheel looks bad, but since it did start and run looking like this, it means that this flywheel is still in working condition. Now, the issue with this Honda engine is that it doesn't have a separate head. Instead, it's one casting. The only way to open the engine is to remove the sump. I'm pretty sure this was a cost-saving measure for manufacturing, and I thought I was going to hate it, but as you'll see later on, it's actually quite smart. Now, this engine does have an annoying clutch for the blade, so before we split the block, we need to take it off. The reason I don't care for this system is that it's just another thing to fail, which if you saw earlier in the series, the original one did fail. The last thing we need to disconnect are the linkages on the governor arm and its spring. After that we can then remove the four bolts around the back side of the engine and the last four bolts on the bottom of the sump. For the sake of video time I didn't show it but I did break each bolt loose before using my impact. That way I reduced the chances of breaking the bolts. Once all the bolts are out, I'm going to drive a large screwdriver between these tabs. The only thing that's holding the sump to the rest of the block is the sealer on the mating surface. Now try not to pry on the tabs because there are dowel pins here and you can damage the tabs by prying instead of driving the screwdriver between them. Now once one side is broken loose, move to the other side of the block and do the same thing there. After some more tapping, you should be able to move the sump away from the block. So here's the sump, and it's basically the bottom of the engine. This part is the governor arm, and it makes contact with the oil slinger, which is also the governor. There's still some sludge at the bottom, which is quite typical on an engine with this many hours on it. Now, for the next part, you might want to take out the spark plug. That way you can easily turn the crank by hand. Now, it's hard to see if there's any extra movement from the connecting rod on the journal, so we need to take a better look. Next, remove the connecting rod cap and inspect it for any damage. <laughs> 
Once the cap is off, you can see there's no separate bearing. Instead, the cap is the bearing surface. Now, I'm quite surprised that it looks this good. There's no gouging or scratches or even any scuffing. Now, I want to take a better look at the journal and the big end of the rod, so we need to get them out of the engine. However, the timing belt is in our way, and that means we need to take off the valve cover. Now, once the bolts are off the cover, I would turn the engine over and pry it from the top. That way, if you damage the cover, it's less likely to leak at the top of the cover versus the bottom. After that, remove the pin holding the plastic cam gear in place, then work it out of the engine. After that, we can then get the crank, the rod, and the piston out of the block. Once the piston is out of the cylinder, you can see some major scratches on the exhaust side of the engine. Even though it looks bad, a cylinder hone should get the scratches out. Now the damage on the intake side doesn't look as bad, so it shouldn't have any problems there either. So from the noises this engine was making while it was running, and with this sort of damage, the noise could be from the piston slapping the cylinder wall, but we need to continue our inspection before we can say it's the reason for the noise. So I put the cap back on the rod, and I can't see any damage to the bearing surface at all. That means the noises we were hearing wasn't from a worn connecting rod, which would have caused a knocking noise. Even the rod journal looks to be in great shape, with only minor scuffing and nothing else. It still has a mirror finish on it. So I can safely say that even though this engine was ran for a long time low on oil, the noise wasn't from the bottom end of the engine. It's at this point I noticed the upper crank journal has some gouges on it. Now this is the top part of the engine and if the oil was low, this area would suffer the most damage. Now if the steel crank looks like this, I'm sure the block must look a lot worse. And as expected, the bearing surface is extremely gouged. With the crank being steel and the bearing being a softer metal, it would mean that the lack of lubrication has caused an excessive amount of wear to the bearing surface. There's so much wear, there's now too much clearance between the bearing and the journal, and that's allowing the top part of the crank to basically wobble. I do believe this is what's causing the noise from the engine, and unfortunately, the repair for this is not good news. If I put the crank back into the block and then move it around, you can see there's just too much play. I don't have the best equipment for measuring bore diameters, but in this case, I think it's safe to say there's just too much clearance. So if I wanted to fix this engine, I would need to hone the cylinder to remove the scratches, replace the piston and rings, and unfortunately, we'd have to either resize the crank by welding more material on it and then resizing it, and then I would have to bore the top bearing for a larger crank journal. Now the machine work alone would cost as much as a new mower, so that's out of the question. The next choice would be to replace the block, but yet again, it would cost about half of a new mower. In the end, for parts and labor, not including your own time, the cost would be somewhere between three to six hundred dollars. Even though this thing is beyond repair, it was still a working engine, so I'm going to put it back together. That way, I don't lose any of the parts, and it'll be more convenient to store as a whole engine. However, I won't be putting it back together as a usable engine, and that's because I won't be using any gasket maker or RTV to seal it up. The reason is, I don't intend on using this on any mower deck. This is one of the worst sounding engines I've ever come across, and even though I've never seen one of these throw a rod through the block, I still don't feel right using it. To install the timing belt, turn the crankshaft so that the arrow on the crankshaft lines up with the mark on the cylinder casting that points to the front of the engine. Then when installing the cam gear, there are two marks across the top that should be parallel with the valve cover mounting surface. If it isn't parallel, then adjust the timing belt at the gear at the crank. After that, you can then reinstall the rocker arms. The best part is that this is actually a lot easier to deal with than push rods. I can see why they did it this way. It just saves time and energy, which would save the company money. Now, once everything is lined up, reinstall the pin for the cam gear and make sure that the part that's raised is away from the valve cover. That's because part of the valve cover will retain the pin. We're about to close the engine, so check the timing marks one last time on the cam gear and the crank, and then replace the sump. Another reason why this engine may have gotten to this point is if the engine oil got contaminated with gasoline from the tank, it would thin out the oil and that would be just as bad as not having enough oil. The reason why the two would get mixed together is if the carb isn't able to keep the gas from entering the engine while in storage. The gasoline would then make its way into the combustion chamber and then leak past the rings and into the block where the oil is. If you mow your lawn every week and there's plenty of gasoline in the tank when you put it up, but when you try to use it the next time it's empty, try checking the oil level to see if it's higher than normal and if the oil on the dipstick smells like gasoline instead of oil.
Now when installing the rocker arms, they only fit one way on their posts. Just make sure their arms are against the plastic cam lobe and then drop the pin into the post from the top. After they've been installed, replace the valve cover and its bolts. So what do I intend on doing with this engine? Well, if it isn't picked apart, it'll either be a garage or shop ornament. Now there's still a perfectly good rod, valve cover, flywheel, and ignition coil that I can use on another Honda engine. I might even use the muffler for that big walk behind leaf blower, which doesn't have one right now. Now, to ensure that the timing belt was correctly installed, replace the spark plug and then turn the engine over by hand. If you feel the engine compression fighting back as you get close to top dead center on the compression stroke, then the timing belt was correctly installed. However, if you turn the engine and you feel little to no resistance from the engine, then the timing belt might be off by one or a couple of teeth. If you intend on using this engine, you're going to have to open it up and reset the belt. We're almost done putting this engine back together. The next thing to put back on is the clutch assembly for the blade stop. If yours doesn't have this, then you just need to put the recoil assembly back on, followed by the spring and linkages for the governor arm. If I had a carburetor to install, this would be the time to do it as well. Unfortunately, this whole situation stemmed from poor maintenance, and it was the most basic step as well. Make sure there's enough oil in the engine. Now there was some oil in it and it was enough for the slinger to get oil to most of the internal parts except for the part that's the furthest away from the oil which of course was the top bearing. So my question is what do you think I should do with this engine? Should I have resealed it and put it on another deck and use it till it breaks or should I try and sell parts off this engine and put that money towards another new or used engine instead? Thank you for watching I really appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions. And I hope to see you in the next video.